This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show, my podcast partner, galactic space geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer. This is one of those episodes where galactic space geek Jeff is super excited. He's basically jumping up and down in his chair. This is so exciting. What problem are we solving today? How do you design a space station? Oh, now I get it. How do you design a space station? Jeff, tell me who our guest is. Our guest today is the one and only Lou Ramon, who is a former NASA engineer who's worked on all of the programs, basically. And now in retirement, he is a docent with me at Space Foundation Discovery Center. Oh, this is so exciting. Welcome to the show, Lou. I am glad to be here. We are so excited to have you. I can just see Jeff's smile. Listeners, you can't see it. Jeff's smile is about five miles long right here. (laughs) He's having lots of fun. In fact, I'm going to let you ask the first question, Jeff. Go ahead. All right. My first question is one I've never had a chance to ask while we've been at the Discovery Center together. Did you always know that you wanted to be an engineer? Ooh. Not always, but just about. There was a time when I thought it might be good to be a lawyer. (laughs) Oh. And then someone reminded me (laughs) that I'd have to argue against some things that I really believed in. Uh, And I said, no, I didn't want to do that. Let's work on airplanes and spaceships and stuff like that. I I like that much better. I tend to agree with that assessment. I think I would do that. And that's what we're talking about. Where do you even start to begin to design a spaceship or a space station or a lunar module? All of these amazing things we've created with NASA. Well, one of the first things you have to do, and it sounds really simple, is figure out what is it you want this thing to do? Uh, It's different doing a lunar module than it would be a space station, for example, you know, sure. you have to know what you want. Yes. Is it going to have to have people in it? Oh, how big is it going to be? Where is it going to go? Something to give you a framework. And then once you do that, now you have to start to figure out what do I need to make this thing do its job? I mean, like with you guys, it would be different if you were going to design a doghouse. <laughs> or, an sure. building, or a sports arena you know it's oh, yes kind of yes thing. the first step is figuring out what you want it to do and it, you can't make one building or one design do everything in the world so you got to be kind of realistic about that okay. and then you have to also get some ideas on who's going to be involved what kind oh. of people are going to be involved in building it right designing right it, and using it Like when we were building the space station, we knew it was going to be an international group. Right. So we had to figure out how are we going to work, not just with NASA people and the contractors like the Boeings and the Rockwells and the Northrop Grubbins and those guys, but how are we going to work with our international partners and start to get together with them and figure all that out? I'm assuming, what about the more cooks in the kitchen thing? That's, that's just the first thing that popped into my head. Do you have someone who's in charge overall, or does everyone just throw ideas at each other? Well, and that's where it was kind of interesting, because while I'm going to say NASA was in charge overall, we on the space station had international partners. Now, that's different than when I worked on designing the space shuttle and was working on the manipulator arm, the remote robot right. arm. Okay. And Canada was providing that 
but they were doing the development work and then NASA would buy it from them. Oh, on the space station, it was a team and we had to figure out how are we going to work together because the Russian parts of the space station belong to Russia. The robot parts of the space station belong to Canada. It's not we're giving it to NASA or NASA's buying it. This is a a different relationship. And we had to think about how we do that. At the top end, we had to figure out what it would do. We had to make some decisions as to, you know, how much power we're going to have to provide, how much communications we need, what we need to keep the astronauts and the visitors alive. (laughs) <laughs> and kind like of that. important. <laughs> so you know. once, once you do that, then you got to start to figure out now, OK, say I have this much power. Well, how much does each part get? I have to look at each part that we're going to have oh. and then decide that, for example, working on the robot systems. Right. You know, how much power and how much communication bandwidth and how much weight am I going to, if you will, give? the Canadian Space Agency for their part of it, or the Russians for theirs or the Japanese for theirs. So you got to partition all that out. And a lot of that at that point at the beginning is just what we'll call engineering judgment, because you don't have a whole lot of ideas of details yet to work with. So you got to make some top end decisions. Sure. So, Lou, you know, with you and I both working together at the Space Foundation Discovery Center and teaching in the museum, we teach the engineering design process for field Mm -hmm. trips to students. And we walk them through the different steps of the model. But it's sounding like this international part of it adds a whole other dimension to Yes, you have to do all of the engineering steps to make sure it actually works. But then it sounds a lot like you're adding that human piece to make (laughs) sure it works with the Americans and the Canadians and the Russians and the Japanese. And and you have to learn. and, And for me, part of the fun part was getting to learn and work with these different people from different places. And and it it really amazed me how much we all were alike and how much we were different. And it wasn't until we stepped back a little bit that we realized that we had different viewpoints on a couple of things. An example, one of the earlier meetings that we had with the Russians, we were asking the Russians to change the design of some of the parts of the space station that they were going to bring up. Okay. Okay. And they were getting a little bit concerned because they thought we were just trying to be pushy (laughs) <laughs> and okay. you know, we didn't want to change our design. We wanted them to change theirs because we could. And right. that way they'd have to pay for it. And we wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> In talking to them, it finally dawned on me that what was happening was that they thought our robot arm on the space shuttle had the same capability as some of the robot systems that they had on their spaceships. And it turns oh. out we actually had less. Oh. Our robot arm was on the left-hand side, the port side of the space shuttle. Okay. And it had a limited reach. So we right. needed them to change some of their hardware so that our arm could put it where it belonged when we brought it up in the space shuttle. Oh. Their arm is on a turntable. So it could swing around. It had much greater range of motion. Oh, that's interesting. And once it dawned on me that we were coming from two different ideas of what capabilities we had. Right. Oh, yeah. NASA has to have the same capability as we do, at least. Right. Turned out this wasn't the case. Once we realized that and they saw we weren't just trying to get them to pay for something because we didn't want to. Right. It was, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll help you. There's that kind of thing. And then there was the language barrier. And it turns out right over that we had the most difficulty in communications with the Canadians more than we did with the Japanese or the Europeans or the Russians, because we realized the Japanese and the Europeans and the Russians spoke a different language. So we were very careful. Oh, ah. like ours. 
So one of the, the big things that when you're working with large groups like this, right, is making sure you do communicate so that your part A fits with their part B. And oh, as it happened okay. in the case on the space station, we called our systems system A, B, and C. They had systems one and two, and obviously system A went to system one until we okay. got their hardware up on the space station and tried to hook our cable from system A into theirs. And when we made the hookup, they didn't see the power coming in. Oh, and we geez. finally figured out that no, our assumption that A, A went to one, one isn't the same assumption that they had. And you we know, wow. end up some jumpers on the next shuttle flight to crisscross. So what I'm actually picturing, and this will connect to our younger listeners, is when we run summer camp here at the Discovery Center, we have had our kids building a Mars habitat out of cardboard oh, wow. now yeah. inside of big rooms. So it's actually a super fun project. And this would be a lot like school team projects, but the kids are building them in teams. But sometimes the team is separated to where half of the team is doing something else, not working on the build. And they do something wrong, quote unquote, in terms of, oh, we weren't going to put the wall there or no, you cut the window or the door in the wrong place. But the same team members were they just weren't communicating right. So even though they were on the same team, what they thought was obvious project did not end up the right way. Kids can really relate if grownups and really smart grownups from NASA and other space agencies are having these same issues. Oh, yes. The lesson there is don't assume that the person you're talking to, I don't care if that person is from the same school you're in, or a different school in a different state or okay. different yeah. country understands it. Make sure that, that you do have that feedback. I think it's, I don't want to say a miracle. It's a real tribute to the kind of people, the quality of engineers that we had on the ISS. Nice. That it, truly, except for those couple of jumper cables, <laughs> everything fit and worked like it should because we never had the ability to get all the pieces together at the same time. They were built in different countries. Wow. They were built at different times, you know, over a decade. And yet when we got them there, except for those couple of cables, wow. yeah, they all fit. That That's, really is amazing. That is amazing. That's kind of what you have to do when you start out is make sure you're communicating. Make sure you're working with the people and telling them, here's what your allocation is. This is what you've got to work with. And a lot of times that is just, oh, I'm going to say an, an engineering judgment call mm -hmm. because this stuff hasn't been invented yet. It hasn't been <laughs> done before. And that's what makes right. it fun. Yeah, because you're not doing the sure. same thing the same way every time. This is different. When we were doing the arm, the Canada arm for the space right. shuttle, we had to tell the Canadians what kind of accuracy they needed to design their arm oh. to perform at. Right. Okay. Don't diagram that sentence. But we had to, <laughs> we had to work on that, and we'd never built anything like this before. So we we only had a limited amount of simulation that we could use right. way back then. And then we had to use judgment. And actually it came down to one Saturday afternoon. We were in our team leader's backyard having a barbecue. Uh -huh. It was time. The next week we had to pin this stuff down and tell the Canadians what they needed to do for their robot arm. Right in order to have any chance of beating schedules. And we said, okay, if we had stuff in the payload bay on the orbiter, satellites that we we're going to deploy or put back in, right. how close together should they be before we worry about banging things? And we looked back and the distance from his patio to his back fence was roughly 60 foot, about the same as the shuttle payload bay. 
So we all kind of looked at that and said, <laughs> what seems reasonable? Because it, it doesn't do any good to give someone a, a design problem that can't be achieved. You right. don't want to make it too easy. I mean, you want to develop the technology. Right. But it's got to be a doable do because if you ask them to do something that's impossible, your whole program has gone up in smoke. So we looked and said, you know, probably if we had things two foot apart, that's good enough. And that was just <laughs> an engineering judgment that we made. <laughs> 15 years later, when we were building the space station, the folks that were responsible for carrying up all the stuff especially at the end of the space station, all the spare parts and stuff like that, had a shuttle payload bay full of different pieces. Oh, wow. And they were getting crowded or running into problems because there wasn't enough room to carry everything they wanted and have it be two feet apart. Right. right. So they wanted to know how realistic is that requirement? So they called us now old guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, this, this was 15 years later. Sure. And said, you know, you guys developed all this. How realistic is it? Are we constrained by that? And we told them, yeah, you are, because it was designed and tested to that. We probably could do better, but you're going to have to go back and do a whole bunch of retest. Right. And right. And have schedule and time for that. And they asked, well, how did you arrive at this, expecting that we would tell them about a whole bunch of tests and simulations? And we Quiet. said, well, we were, in, we were in Glenn Miller's backyard. We held up our thumbs and looked at his tent. Well, I had spilled some mustard off of my hot dog <laughs> That's right. on his porch, and we decided two feet. There now, you that's have not it. That's the way NASA always does things, <laughs> nor is it the way the young people that are coming up and being engineers today are going to do things because you got so much better tools. They have, yeah. They and have you have simulators much more and... experience. Back then, we didn't have those kind of simulators. Yeah. We didn't have those luxuries. We didn't have the experience. Yeah. When the young folks today that are going to be designing the robot arms and things like that for lunar outposts or Mars missions, they've got a lot of background now that they can fall back on. Right, right. Say, ah, we know this worked, but we can do better. Yeah, but you, you know- You have to think about that as you work through this operation. Exactly, but sometimes I think, I mean, so I write books and sometimes you get stuck. So when you're in the office and there's a group of you and you might be like, oh my gosh. And so sometimes taking a break is when you have that scientific or engineering breakthrough, when you can just relate it to things that you see, you know, the distance between the patio and the fence. Okay, now we can look at it. Let's maybe even move some tables around, right? Like <laughs> we'll put a table here and oh, then we'll yeah, see yeah. how far apart it is. Yeah, and so you don't want to discount engineering judgment. You know, we had a, a problem with our engineers at NASA as we were starting to move into the post-shuttle, post-space station programs. Right. And we're looking at Artemis and things like that because we had a bunch of engineers who had, for most of their career, worked on the space shuttle. Okay. Right. And we operated under Gene Kranz's guidance that said failure is not an option. Right. But now when you get into an Artemis program or you start looking at going on to Mars. Yep. It's not an operational vehicle like the shuttle was. No. You got to get back to thinking about research and development. And we actually had some programs where we trained our middle and senior engineers to begin to think research and development again. We had some real low cost programs wow. where we would pair senior engineers from shuttle. Mm hmm with young engineers one or two years out of college. Wow. And the philosophy was not that failure wasn't an option. You learn by doing testing to find out what's going to happen. Yes. So we said, you know, you got to do this. If we don't see smoke coming out of the lab now and then you're not trying hard <laughs> enough. We just don't want you to burn the whole thing down. And it was impressive the technology that the young people have today and how they can use that technology in yes. ways that we don't think about. 
Oh, yeah. Moms and dads that are listening, I want you guys to know and remember that you heard it here from NASA engineer Lou, that if your kids are not creating smoke in the house once in a while, <laughs> they may not be doing enough science. But remember, the, the idea is not to burn it down. Not to burn it okay, down. Okay, okay. We got that added now. Yeah. <laughs> but you run into these kind of problems. And as engineers, you have the, the real tough technical problems, and then you have the everyday problems. Like I say, communication. Right. You reach a point where you've got to make it work. It's got to happen. We had a situation on space station where my team, and I worked with some really, really great young people in California and Texas, Alabama, and mm -hmm. Florida. They were doing an inspection just after we put one of the pieces of the space station into the payload bay. Right. And they noticed that we had some tubing that carried ammonia coolant, part of the radiator and thermal system. Right. Too close to where the robot arm was supposed to grab onto that piece to take Ooh. it out. We had set up a keep out zone, kind of like that two foot. Right. <laughs> where we wanted to make sure that if the robot operator sneezed or we had <laughs> okay. a, a problem in the circuitry and something hiccuped or jerked or vibrated sure that we wouldn't damage anything yes so okay. we wanted that keep out zone and they saw that this cabling or this tubing was too close and so because i was responsible for the robot systems my boss came to me and said louis you guys got to fix this how are we going to do that well the simple thing of cutting that tubing and rerouting it wouldn't work because it already was full of ammonia. It was already installed in the oh. shuttle. And this would have meant emptying that whole system, cutting it, right. cleaning it, right. putting it back together, checking the whole thing out. It would have added weeks, taken a couple maybe. of months. Yeah, months. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It would have taken months and millions of dollars to do. So that was not an option. So we looked at what to do. And one of my guys remembered that the way the end effector, the grappling part was designed mm -hmm. and the way the thing it grabbed, the grapple fixture was designed was we had some cams and guides so that when you got real close and were about ready to grab it, the arm couldn't move very far before it would run into some of these guides. Right. And would be self-limiting. And he worked out on analysis, graphic uh, analysis using his CAD system that this was down low enough that it would be impossible for the grappler to run into this tubing. Hey, that's great. But now how do we know <laughs> that the real world is built like the drawings are? Because we already, on the drawings, those tubes weren't supposed to be where they are. <laughs> so he suggested that we, you know, one of the ideas was take the real grappler and carry it out there and try it. And that made sense until you realized that that end effector and the grapple fixture weighed over 100 pounds. Wow. And it would involve somebody shinning out on some work platforms on your belly <laughs> and holding that and seeing if it fit. And if you dropped it, you not only mess up part of the space shuttle, but you mess up the whole payload. So Which that was an expensive <laughs> yes. and dangerous, to say the least. <laughs> And Norm suggested, well, let's make a 3D model of this. So we called the NASA management and our Boeing management together and presented this idea. And they didn't like it a bit. They didn't think it would work. Oh. So they left the meeting and Norm turned to me and says, what do we do? And I said, well, you know, you guys, my team thought this was the best way to approach it. I'm going to side with you. We're going to go do it this way. Okay. And if it doesn't work, they'll let us know. <laughs> okay. So I like when my boss supports that me. That's engineering good. judgment. This was the best solution. It wasn't a popular one, but it was the best one. Right. Okay. Very good. We did it. Norm carried that 15 pound 3D model out to the Cape, shinnied out over the payload bay, put it in and fit and saw that it would work. We changed what would have been a problem to a non problem because he understood what capabilities we had and he had a good idea on how to fix them. 
Well, nice. sometimes that's how it works, right? He saved the day. I made sure he got some recognition and a nice bonus. <laughs> Very nice. For that. Very nice. But when you're designing something, you're designing it to last a certain length of time. Now, we're not good enough engineers. When somebody says, I want to design something to work for 15 years, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I know how to design it so that it will last at least 15 years. And I can test that. Right. OK, but the only people I know that can really tell when something's going to fail the thing is going to fail two days after the warranty is out. I don't know how they do that, but they're the <laughs> only ones that can seem to do it. But we'll design it to work this. But we know it's going to fail. It's not a matter of if it fails, it's when it fails. We right. just can't build things perfectly. That's why in all this, you have to decide how much redundancy and backup. Right. You have right. and how you design it so that it can be repaired or maintained for that life. To me, I feel like right now we're in such an exciting time of space travel. All of these different things are happening. They're not going fast, right? Not fast, fast, but they feel like it in some ways, right? Because the technology right. yeah. has gotten so good that you just hear all of these amazing things and it's I think it's great to get excited about it and the international prospects that we're going to have, hopefully, too. What's really going to be interesting, and you guys are going to get to see it much more than I, is when all this stuff comes together, it's going to come together quickly. The development part's a long time. But when it comes together, when we get ready to fly it all, it's going to come together in a pretty tight wow. cluster, and it's going to be extremely exciting. The youngsters, I say youngsters, shoot, you guys are youngsters. Um, <laughs> Not quite, but sure. Appreciate young that. People today, the kids that are in school today, the kids that are just starting their engineering careers today, the kids that are thinking about engineering tomorrow are going to live in an exciting and very, very creative time. I agree. Agreed. Lou, I think we could talk to you for forever, but we're come to that part of the show where we ask you if you have a challenge for our listeners. So what exciting thing do you have for our listeners to do today? Have I got a challenge for you? This one is related to a little bit of what we've been talking about on the development of the remote manipulator arm for the shuttle. What we want to talk about is a challenge that will help you understand a little bit more about the difference between accuracy and precision. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a couple of pieces of paper and then get a pencil, a marking pen, something like that where you can mark on that paper, and a ruler. And the first thing I want you to do is take one piece of that paper and put it on the table in front of you. Just lay it flat. And as you look at it, imagine a line going from top to bottom of that paper down the middle of the paper. Now I want you to take your marker pen and I want you to put a mark on that paper that would be about two inches, four or five centimeters, to the right of the middle of that paper, to the right of that imaginary center line that you see. Put a mark there. Now after you've done that, I want you to take that same marker and look up about halfway between that first mark and the top of the paper, put another mark that would be about two inches to the right of that center line. And then lastly, I want you to take and make a third mark down in the bottom half of the paper, again, about two inches to the right of that center line. Okay? Now, when you've done that, I want you to take the piece of paper fold it in half and make a crease down the middle. Then open it up. Now you've got that center line marked with a crease. So take your ruler out and measure the distance from the first mark you made to where that crease is, to that imaginary center line. That shows a little bit of how accurately you were able to estimate and mark it. And then for consistency, do the same for the marks that you made above and below that first mark. And write down those distances. They're probably close, but not exactly the same distance from that crease. Then I want you to take the second piece of paper 
And on this piece of paper, I want you to fold it like you did the first one. Put that crease in it. Now open it up. Now what I want you to do is take your marker pen, and I want you to put a mark right on that crease in the middle of the page. Can you do that? Then take that same marker pen and about halfway between the first mark and the top of the page, put another mark right on that crease. And then I want you to take and make a third mark right on that same crease between the middle mark and the bottom of the page. Okay, when you've done that, now take your ruler out. And this time I want you to try to measure the distance between each of those marks and that crease. It's probably not very much. See if you can measure how much it is. So that second mark is showing you your precision or how precisely you can make a mark if you've got a guideline to aim for. And that's the difference between accuracy, how well you can place a point in space, and precision, how precisely you can control where you're aiming and hit that point every time. Lou, I think we could talk to you forever about your experiences. And funny thing is, we didn't even get into some of the coolest stuff that you've done. So we're definitely going to have to have you back. But we yes. went so far into space stations that if our listeners are not looking up ISS, the Lunar Gateway, space stations, mm -hmm. after this kind of talk, I do not know what's going to get them excited about space stations up there. Yeah. Well, it's I'll tell you amazing. something that, that still excites me, and they'll have this to look forward to, too, is I often wondered how an architect feels when she goes by a big building, a skyscraper, yes, or yes. a dam, and says, you know, I was part of that. Well, I got outside the other night, and I could see the space station oh, go my over gosh. Wow. and realize, I you know, hey, I was part of that. The young people today, the young engineers that are in their careers, the people that are kids that are they're in high school and college, those that are in elementary school, they're going to be creating these things. Yep. There will be a time not too long when they can go out at night and they'll see this thing go overhead or they'll see the lunar base and they'll see the gateway. And they'll be able to say that same kind of thing. There, there are just so many opportunities for that. And that really is a rewarding experience. It's amazing. I think this is actually the best place to end the podcast because, again, we could talk to you forever. And the next time I go out and see the ISS fly over, because I look for it all yeah. the time, I will be thinking about you in this episode. So thank you for that, Lou. Yes. Well, thank you guys for inviting me and letting me take your time. And the folks that are listening to this, thank you for listening and putting up with this old guy talking. <laughs> well, it was wonderful having you on Solve for Kids. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Bye-bye. A conversation with Lou is like a trip through NASA and a trip through time. And I always feel like I'm there with them working on the things that he's working on. What do you think, Jen? I mean, I'm really kind of speechless. I feel like, wow, I wish I had your life. Or better, just, you know, could sit on your shoulder and watch all of these amazing things that he got to do. And I'm really grateful that he shared that with us today and our listeners. I think it was so fascinating to learn all these things. Agreed with as much that is going on in the space industry right now with SpaceX and Blue Origin and NASA and going back to the moon and moving on to Mars. All of those programs are rooted in all of the programs that Lou already worked on. So when you're thinking about space and galactic space geek Jeff's brain thinks about this all the time, everything that we have done in the past builds to the next programs that we're going to be doing, which are the programs that our listeners are going to grow up and work on just like Lou did. Yeah, that's so cool. And I love to just sit back and watch it. All of the amazing things that are going on right now and how fast they're happening. 
So listeners, if you do Lou's challenge, or if you want to just learn more about Lou, make sure that you go to our website, solveitforkids.com, and be sure and tag us on our social media, which is at Kids Solve. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We would love to hear from you, especially we're interested to hear if you learned something new about NASA that maybe you didn't know. Excellent. And for more great guests all through 2022, join us on Solve It for Kids. Kids.